few weeks ago, Dr. Shockley wrote me to suggest that when he appeared on this program, he should be wired into a polygraph machine which would, which would register any insincerity in his positions. I was quite taken by the idea, and like Dr. Shockley, thought it would be something of a television precedent to have instant lie detection applied to all of the guests of firing line. But in fact, I do not doubt Dr. Shockley's sincerity, and in fact, I do not know who does. I simply doubt that his prescription should be encouraged for reasons that no doubt will be discussed. Dr. Shockley is, of course, the Nobel <coughs> Prize winning a discoverer or co-discoverer of the transistor, without which many of the world's benefits and not a few of its afflictions would be denied to us. He was born in England of American parents, went to the California Institute of Technology, took his PhD in electrical engineering from MIT, served as an expert consultant for many years for the Bell Telephone Company, <coughs> and went to Stanford University as a professor in 1963. Shortly thereafter, he became interested in eugenics and proposed giving a course in the subject, permission denied. His thesis is that there are identifiably more intelligent and less intelligent races, and that something ought to be done about something he calls dysgenics. He has wandered about the country seeking college audiences and is most often denied a hearing, as, for instance, most recently at Yale University, where the civil rights of those who wanted to hear Dr. Shockley debate were denied, without anything like that <clears throat> kind of corporate remorse in which fashionable colleges specialize when the speaker denied <clears throat> is a, um, a Maoist. I should like to begin by asking Dr. Shockley whether he has in fact studied eugenics in the sense that professors of biology have studied eugenics. Well, Mr. Buckley, the uh, <clears throat> studies available on eugenics have an interesting history. One of the uh, plans I talk about is a eugenics measure, the uh, so-called voluntary sterilization bonus plan, and thinking hyphen exercise underlined when I put it in, uh, in writing. This was actually proposed by H.L. Mencken, I think, with tongue in cheek about 1935. I did a uh, study on the uh, books on eugenics in the Stanford Library at one time, and this came up uh, with a very interesting result that uh, in the early 20s, there were a large number of books that were acquired by the Stanford Library. But <clears throat> after Hitler came into power, uh, it dropped down. So I think there may have been periods there of three or four years when not a single acquisition occurred in the library that uh, was listed under, uh, under eugenics. One of the most surprising and disconcerting things I ran into in that uh, phase of my research was to uh, come across a volume or two volumes, which was called, as I re remember, the uh, Second International Conference on uh, Family and Eugenics. And as I opened the frontispiece, looked in it, here was a picture that was familiar to me. And when I read down and uh, found out who this uh, distinguished white-bearded man was, I discovered that it was Alexander Graham Bell, the father of the telephone. And Alexander Graham Bell, in uh, his career, had done some studies on uh, hereditary factors, the incidence of hereditary deafness, and also the uh, inheritance of longevity. And the statements made in the beginning of that book by a number of speakers were such that if uh, one approached making them now, this was, I believe, about 1920, making them now, it would produce uh, all of the violent reactions and graffiti on the walls that uh, one sees around the universities where Jensen and Herrnstein uh, have encountered these things even more than I have. Oh, uh, it, oh is, <coughs> is what you're saying that um, Racism is more shocking now than it was a generation ago because this is obvious. Well, you've used but the much, word uh, racism. Uh, but much, much uh, of what was said uh, in the 19th century by people like uh, Lincoln and so on and so forth uh, is, very, very abhorrent, abhorrent, is, un okay. is unspeakable now. Well, the, the, word is, ra the word racism is a word which, when it enters a discussion like this, I think needs to uh, be covered and compared with another proposed word. Okay, let's do that. But first of all, just tell me, are you, uh, I didn't really quite understand your answer. I was asking you whether you were qualified as a geneticist in the sense that 24-year-old pre-PhD or post-PhD students are. And you, you start talking about Alexander Graham Bell, and it wasn't quite clear what well, the my, linkage my was. My main thesis in this, uh, Mr. Buckley, 
is that this is an area of thought blocks, of profound moral irresponsibility, and in that area, I'm one of the most expert people there is. The let me take box, you. No, no, I'm talking about the box. I'm talking about, um, let me ask you this. Suppose, suppose somebody put a mask on your face and stuck you into an examination room with a bunch of 23-year-olds taking uh, a master's degree, let's say, in genetics. Would you pass? I'm not sure that I would, you see, because I have not uh, put great emphasis on some of the conventional aspects of this. Mm -hmm. If you were to put me in a room with uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky, who has done uh, research on the uh, heritability of certain behavioral traits in fruit flies, mm -hmm. and we were to discuss uh, Dobzhansky's data and uh, some of his conclusions, and this were to be done in something resembling a debate context, I'm afraid that Dobzhansky would not come out so well. Mm -hmm. Because in calculating his heritability, he did not take into account certain probabilistic considerations that apply to this. And when he assumes that a fruit fly that takes uh, 13 turns to the right may be, uh, have different behavior genetics than one which takes 12 turns to the right, he's not taking into account the fact there'll be a large variance in these number of turns. So that's one area I've studied. The most important one I've studied has to do with questions of race and identi identification, mm -hmm. determination of the fraction of Caucasian ancestry in American Negroes. Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, I, I go into this um, for the obvious reason that um, people tend to be disposed in our, in our society, which is very academically <coughs> oriented, to uh, give more or less credence according as uh, the speaker is, or is not uh, professionally uh, the master of the field concerning which he, he chooses to speak. This doesn't mean that you can't be a great poet without having a PhD in literature. And I'm not aware whether it means that you can master eugenics without uh, being able to take that examination. But, uh, but I take it that um, your field of interest is, is a very limited one, and that though it impinges on eugenics, it does not bespeak necessarily the kind of mastery of it that is required of a professor of eugenics, is that correct? I'm not aware that there is a professor of eugenics. In terms of uh, dealing with those aspects of genetics, and of human genetics, human behavior genetics, that are relevant to the problems of dysgenics, then, uh, and furthermore, let me say that uh, a distinction that I think I made in writing to you <clears throat> is that I draw a very definite distinction, and here is where the question of sincerity comes in, and I think we should come back to that one because uh, the position which you uh, took in your column, to which I responded, does seem to me to, uh, the only way I can read it is a severe expression of doubt as to my sincerity. But the point I wanted to make uh, on this is... Yeah, don't that forget that other one, because uh, the, yeah, one it's, 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 it's a little hit and run the way you've managed it right now. Well, uh, Mr. Buckley, I'm doing my best to manage it in the most educational way possible. Well, why don't and you I'm sure you've had some was, experience on this. Uh, well, should we, should we touch the matter of your sincerity? Where, wherein was your sincerity doubted? Uh, oh, incidentally, Buckley, I don't think sincerity is all that important. I think Hitler was perfectly sincere. I don't, and I'm not comparing you to Hitler. Well, I'm just but, but uh, taking I don't, the, I don't the, think that to say somebody is sincere is necessarily to pay him the most relevant Well, the, the issue, Mr. Buckley, was uh, you essentially uh, described me as being, uh, as being in the, uh, in the uh, line of activity, which uh, was quite in keeping with Hitler, as you say. How, you how said, did I do uh, that now? Well, you I said, uh, describing Shockley, you would use sperm banks contributed by the very <coughs> brightest men destined to impregnably, uh, impregnate the very brightest women around, and before too long, we would all be sounding like Albert Einstein. What's wrong with that? In the first place, Hitler didn't want anybody to sound like Albert Einstein. Uh, so <coughs> this I, is I, a, I uh, let, let me finish the sincerity question, Mr. Okay. Buckley, if we may. Mm -hmm. This is a drastic impression of Shockley's position. And if I have some of the words wrong, never mind, because the music is right. Mm -hmm. Now, my answer to that, Mr. Buckley, is that I am not focusing on the perfect man. I am focusing on the human misery that may be being produced by the genetic manipulations that result from nobly intended welfare programs. Well, sometimes you are, sometimes you're not. Shall I quote Shockley to Shockley? Yes, fine. Quotes. You got your tape recorder on? Yes. Okay. Restrictions should be placed on the basis of sound genetics without regard to income, class, race, religion, or national origin. The breeding of good genetic material, whether the people are rich or poor, is desirable. We want more Lincolns, not fewer. Did I say this? Yeah. Can you cite the reference? It doesn't sound familiar to me. It is quoted ostensibly from February 1972, The Humanist, by you. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm not against having more Lincolns. But I'm against your saying I'm that sure there's, that there's a hell of a difference between wanting more Lincolns and wanting more Einsteins, and that the one uh, 
and that the one is uh, insincere, the other is not. But, but f forget the question of sincerity, because I don't think that's all that important. In fact, you want uh, restrictions without regard to income, class, race, religion, national origin, which it seems to me uh, means that you are not a racist in the fundamental I never recall using sense. religion in a, in a statement, so I'm really doubtful if that statement is uh, mine. I have a standard one, which I've memorized since about 19, uh, goodness me, 68 or thereabouts, 69, <clears throat> which is that, um, that I have this uh, voluntary sterilization bonus plan. And the way it goes is a bonus would be offered to everyone to be sterilized. Mm -hmm. The amount of the bonus <clears throat> would be uh, dependent on various factors. For example, income taxpayers would be offered no bonus. For all others, regardless of sex, race, or welfare status, those are the criteria I put in, regardless of sex, race, or welfare status, the bonus would depend upon best scientific estimates, and that's a very important qualifying phrase, best scientific estimates, of any genetically carried disabilities, such as arthritis, hemophilia, Huntington's chorea, and if uh, there is a genetic uh, predisposal to heroin addiction, this should get a big bonus. Then I go on to say, furthermore, at $1,000 for every point you score below 100 on an IQ test, mm -hmm. $30,000 put into a trust fund for a 70 IQ moron capable of producing 20 children might very well be economically advantageous to taxpayers in terms of about $100,000, $300,000 in reduced uh, costs of mental retardation care. Now, well, that's a very e simple e calculation. I'll tell you something that would be even more economically <clears throat> advantageous would be to kill them. Well, that, you see, we uh, that disagrees with my fundamental principles on this, Mr. Buckley, How which I've had a try at uh, Are these scientific principles or moral principles? These are moral principles, and I do have some elements in this which are matters of faith, you see. And the, faith the, the, in what? Faith in man. Mr. Faith Buckley. in man. Is this a, a received faith, or is this an individually uh, articulated uh, faith, or, or what? Well, I'm glad you put the question that way, because um, this brings me to one of the main uh, philosophical thoughts I feel I've contributed to this, which I call the <clears throat> an invariance principle. This again goes back to Einstein. Einstein says the laws of nature must be independent of how fast the observer is moving. Mm -hmm. That is, if uh, you can't tell who is standing still in the universe because the, uh, the motion does not affect certain fundamental things, and these are called invariant things. Now, what I have tried to do is to formulate some principles which I think are invariant to whether you believe the brain of man was placed in his head as a result of evolution, evolution of weapon-using apes, who were precursors to man, <clears throat> which the more, those more clever in using weapons actually developed the brains and killed off the other ones. So that <clears throat> I say that or it's equally valid if the brain of man was placed in God when God created him in his own image in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. In either of these things, there is a profound urge and, in fact, an obligation to use the brain. So the first of my three moral postulates that I had an opportunity to <clears throat> put into Presbyterian Life, a magazine then, as a result of a hostile attack by one of their columnists, a very nice fellow on the phone I found in talking to him, um, was the title of the article was Three Moral Postulates, Truth, Concern, Death. And the first one said, the principle, the truth shall make you free, is, means that man has an obligation to use his intelligence to endeavor to understand and to solve the quantity and the quality problems of mankind. And as I say, I believe that conclusion is invariant to one's religious belief over a wide range of beliefs. The second one is a concern now, postulate. Wait a you, say, you, say, you, say, you say it's invariant in the sense that everyone believes it or in the sense that you believe it in any circumstances? Well, I don't believe that an entire population will have, um, will have uniform ideas on almost anything except maybe what goes up must come down, and even yeah. that is now shaken as a result of the development of, uh, of satellites. Yeah. But uh, if I take the group of people, the general area of people who are in, the, in uh, almost any criteria you'd want to use in the upper half of the uh, conscientious segment of the population, or you can make it the upper third or the upper two-thirds, I believe that many of these would, the majority of these would have, would concur in that first moral principle that we do have an obligation to use our brains to try to understand things and to solve them. But now, what kind of, what <laughs> kind of an obligation uh, is this? this? This is an obligation that grows out of your, your faith in what the rational structure of learning and uh, uh, a moral Im imperative that you uh, decocked from your knowledge of the human mission or, or, or what? For, for instance, suppose a Suppose I had, uh, uh, s suppose uh, a facing without any sense of moral reservation, a starvation in Central Africa, uh, and I figured that the, the really most beneficial solution uh, in terms of uh, human suffering would be to uh, reduce the population by 50 percent. Uh, th I thinking, let's say, as a moral robot, 
uh, and, and I could feed those, those data into any machine. Uh, and that machine said, look, it's much less painful to die of a bullet wound than to die protractedly from starvation over a period of a couple of years. What is to keep me from simply proceeding with this sort of bentamite uh, uh, principle? Unless there's a thing called human life to which one doesn't do certain things. What, what in fact, uh, inhibitions do you feel when you're talking about these invariants and so on? Well, one has to get to another, two other moral principles before I can put this in perspective. But uh, in regard to your hypothetical uh, discussion, I would like to introduce a little thinking I did about that, which shows how hard it is sometimes to start from what would seem to be sensible premises and work on to logical conclusions. One finds that there's, there may well be a reductio ad absurdum aspect of it. And I'd like to talk about the one, uh, the objective of mankind, to produce the most happiness for the most. This, I, this is an objective. Let's take that as an objective. I don't, uh, I want as, to say... As, as one, universally accepted? Objective? Well, I just want to deal with that as a piece of uh, logical Why? development. Why? Well, one reason is... Well, how is it related to intelligence? Let's get more Well, it's related it. to the hypothetical experiment you were talking about in Africa, you see. And furthermore, it's shown on these elegant charts, which I seldom have an equally good occasion to show, Mr. Buckley. And what this shows is an experiment done at Caltech. I think the man was Olds. It occurred in about 1956. And what Olds found was if he implanted an electrode in the proper place in the brain of a rat, uh, it gave the rat some great satisfaction if uh, a signal was fed into that electrode. It was hitting some kind of pleasure center. And in fact, if the rat was given his choice of eating some cheese, or pulling the lever, he would become emaciated because he would spend his time pulling the lever rather than um, eating the cheese. Mm -hmm. Now this suggests if one can produce something of deep satisfaction, one might also be able electrically, electrically to make measurements of it. And if one could make measurements of it, then one might be able to measure the amount of happiness and then it might become meaningful to try to optimize it. Now the natural way to try to optimize this for the first step, <coughs> the most happiness for the most, is shown in this one. And here you see, the world population explosion, the limitations of geography, have been taken care of by growing brains in vitreo. And uh, there's one here that is in need of a little bit of remedial action, but you can see that under these cir circumstances, the happiness meter is reading very high. Mm -hmm. So this might be a way of producing the most happiness for the most. Ideal lives could be programmed by the computer and respond to the variations and the statistical fluctuations of the brain so as to give a suitable balance between the, uh, the painful things and the pleasant things so that the overall effect would be my. Those brains would say, we lived a good life. Now, one can go even uh, further as a result so of just, just, just give me the, this is, this is um, what, what you are describing is, um, uh, is, is, is a graphic depiction of something that you approve of. No, this uh, tells Mr. Or, or Buckley why I think one can deal what, constructively uh, with questions like the one you were asking about what about killing, uh, setting up a program to kill half the people in Africa. Yeah. I think we should, you see, I set up an even wider thing and I say this leads me to an absurdity. Mm -hmm. I think your uh, question also leads to an absurdity. Yeah, but I, want to know why I, I want to know why it's an absurdity. I don't think these graphs well, help. Do they? Uh, oh, you mean why your example is an absurdity? Yes. Well, we should or, or even explore these. that more, you or see. I these. think uh, you didn't describe how these people would be killed. This would, in my standards, be well, a painlessly. very important factor. Painlessly. Painfully, painlessly. painlessly yeah. And so the total amount of happiness might be greater on, uh, greater in that group right. of people. Mm -hmm. uh, but would it be greater for you, Mr. Buckley, if you knew your country were doing this? No. Well, you see, not everybody would be happier. The citizens uh, in this country who might share emotions like mine and my concern postulate, which was a third of the three moral postulates, truth, concern, death, I think would be unhappy with this too. And how about the people who remained? Do you think they would be happy to have their brothers, their cousins uh, killed off this way? I'm not at all sure that your proposal would lead to anything like a maximum of happiness. Well, uh, again, this would be a postulation uh, if, if one assumes that there are uh, uh, two people in a room both starving to death. Uh, and the disappearance of one uh, ends the problem of starvation for the other. There is, I think, almost a biologically ineluctable. Uh, well, this is uh, this gets close to the conclusion. problem solved by this. What was it? A basketball team in the Andes, uh, yes. in which they were reduced to cannibalism, and they did a lot of soul searching and. Uh, and I have no quarrel with yeah, they uh, what they had to they, they they corpses. Yeah. Well, the same yeah. thing could happen, you <clears throat> see, in the other area. And it might be that a group of people would gather together and they'd say, we have a contribution. It may be they've discovered some new unique source of energy, and there are only 10 of them. 
And if they don't arrive back, they know that some part of civilization will be greatly damaged by this loss of energy. They might well gather together and draw lots so as to uh, determine which one would be likely to survive. Well, let, let, let's, let's get back to, to, uh, to the, 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 the Shockley thesis. You, you did say restrictions should be placed. But let me just do the on final the basis touch of on sound this. Genetic. Genetic. Excuse Excuse me? Me? I can't resist it. This is the final touch. I want to oh. get transistors into it somehow, you okay. see. So this is, this is the final stage in which you make a com computerized, a computerized duplication of the human brain, mm -hmm. and then you see you can probably do it even more compactly and get a higher achievement. But I just do that as the f finishing touch on, uh, on some of these uh, uh -huh. large-scale objectives. And so to come back to the thing that I think we really want to deal with is this, uh, this word uh, dysgenics, which uh, you see is, is best defined, I think, as um, re retrogressive evolution. You can't have anti-evolution. I tried to do that, but I was set straight by one of my strongest backers in the National Academy of Sciences, Ralph Cheney, the man who was for many years president of the Saver of the Red League and who brought the Dawn Redwood to this country. But he said it can't be anti-evolutionary, it's got to evolve, but it can be retrogressive evolution. So dysgenics is retrogressive evolution through the disproportionate reproduction, the excessive reproduction, of the genetically disadvantaged. And that's what our nobly intended welfare programs may be doing, what some of our modern medicine is doing. They're just not facing the, uh, the quality problems of mankind, and this may produce large amounts of human agony. And what my emphasis is upon anti-dysgenics. Okay, well now let's, let's, let's take this, apart, this argument, uh, if you don't mind, uh, uh, apart analytically. There is, there is, first of all, the, the quantitative problem. A lot of people say, or oh, seem to be agreed, you've got to have less uh, people in India. You've got to have less people in Latin America, right? And then every now and then you get the little, little, little vibration to say, careful, because uh, if we send uh, birth control information to Latin America or birth control uh, information to India or Africa, they'll think it's racist. They'll think it's because it's we want fewer Indians instead of fewer white people. Now. Uh, as I understand it, there hasn't been too much difficulty in exchanging public uh, discourse on that rather sensitive subject. That is to say, most people say, no, 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 we're not talking about Indians because Indians have brown skins. We're talking about Indians because this is a subcontinent in which there is historical starvation. All right, now, you're talking about something else. Now, I want to ask you this question, which I beg you to reply to very specifically. Uh, is it your, is your concern quantitative as regards the projected failure of the North American continent to look after the number of people who are going to be bred according to the existing system? Or is your concern a qualitative one that says, no, I, I Dr. Shockley, don't worry about our capacity to feed 250 million people or 300 million people in the next 100 years, but I worry that the percentage of those who are dumb is going to be perilously great. Which of the two are you worried about? I worry about the resultant human misery across the board. And one of the, the group which is neglected, which people are unwilling to look at, is that there are certain areas in this country, certain small pockets, and uh, <clears throat> some of these we can find information on, in which some of the most genetically disadvantaged are multiplying the most rapidly. And this is, the, this is the focus in which I put, and the thing that I add on to this, and which is so seldom do I have a chance to say, and so I do appreciate being on this uh, program and having a chance to say this, the thing is that I'm, my chief focus, the one thing I'm drawing out is that it's irresponsible to fail to look at the types of lies that some of those whom are do-gooders, are wishful thinkers, I call them berserk humanisms. I think their humanism has gone so far that in, in effect it has gone berserk. And this is the illustration of it. This is the chart I tried so hard to get on CBS program. And uh, at a disruption at the University of Georgia, I held the chart up. Many people saw the chart, but neither on that news nor on the 60-minute hour later did a single word I said about that chart get put on the program. What this shows is, this is Census Bureau data. The highest birth rate I found tabulated in the Census Bureau data, children ever born per woman, and certainly take a certain standardized age range to look at. She's essentially through her childbearing period. The highest number I found was for rural farm black women, and this was 5.4 children. On the other hand, black college graduates average 1.9, women college graduates. That is then, if, if these abilities to learn and so on do have a significant hereditary aspect, 
This implies a pronounced dysgenic effect. This segment of the population would double in about a generation, and this would gradually die away. But now, the effect minute, is much less minute, for whites. Wait a minute. It depends on the movement from one side of the line to the other. Did you look up the figures for 20 years ago? The fact of the matter is that there are more Negro college graduates as a percentage of the population now in America than there are white people in England. Now, the fact, the fact of the matter is that there is this movement from here to here, and under the circumstances, necessarily, it's going to affect uh, that graph uh, 10 years from now. Even so that, number why, why don't you give us a, a graph rather than a, a discrete uh, um, excerpt? Well, this is the simplest one to... Uh, oh, it's not simple at all. It's terribly prepare, misleading. But, uh, you don't want something that's misleading, do you? No, not at I really don't think we'll see what that proves. If, if, if you're saying, well, look... You believe that if you're saying, if you, if you're uh, saying that poorer people... Uh, that there are more black poor people than white poor people as a percentage, the answer is you're correct. But it's also correct that in the last 10 years there have been drastic movement in the other direction. If you're saying that uh, the black people tend to have more children than white people, and that this is a correlation of wealth, that is correct. But it is also correct that Bach was a 19th child out of 20. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I don't see that you, that you can, uh, that you can uh, mulct from these generalities uh, anything that is either um, a, a scandalous or even interesting. You find no interest in this, nothing to worry about well, at all. Well, you're here. I'm interested, in every, I'm interested in lots of people. Right? But, uh, but uh, it seems to me, uh, I'm really surprised but, but at this, I, Mr. Buckley, because it seems to me this is wa waving clearly a warning flag. No, it's not. That, uh, an no, it's not. No, it's I not. Well, well, look, in the, well, let in let the, let in the first let's place, let's, uh, in terms let's of... Let's deal with one of our basic postulates before we no, go on. I'd be, let's not find not out if we have a common basis on this at all to reason. Not, not and on that basis is whether or not uh, such things as mental traits, some of these behavioral traits, are significantly controlled by genes or if they're entirely controlled by environments. I think that's everybody... The fun, that's I think, the fundamental I think one that I've tried to bring up to the National most, Academy of Sciences. Most people agree that they are significantly controlled uh, by genes, but they do so with reference to subtleties which you shrink from, the whole business of the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere and the brain. That's not necessary to and, get and, into and, that. And, and, and in, in any case, you keep dropping the word happiness. There's no reason at all to suppose that somebody like Lincoln or Hamlet are more happy than Aunt Jemima, as far as that goes. Uh, so there's there, uh, so, so you, you rush into a whole lot of social uh, generalities, which are absolutely unjustified by the data, even if the data were themselves arresting. The fact that you failed to graph the movement in these charts in the last ten years well, I, can, I can show you. Uh, I can show you one. Uh, well, not all the data has not been gathered in similar ways in all the studies, but this is a perfectly good study. I don't do everything, Mr. Buckley. But I think that look, uh, if, if I think freeze, that we should you... come back to this basic question. Uh, you have conceded, but not in a way that would be informative to anyone listening to this program, as to what may be the relative importance of genes and environment. Well, that's now, why there is I a very you... precise. There is a very mm. precise one here, in which I say there is the most profound. Uh, as I've used it in something I've written, I regard this uh, failure of intellectual responsibility as being the most grievous dereliction of scientific responsibility in the history of science. And I'm there I talking say... about the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, well, I know what they said about you, which was very unpleasant. And well, I think, I, think, I, think said, uh, I, I, I think they use very harsh and, if I may say so, unscientific language. And there I'm on your side simply as a fellow human being. I don't have quite that reaction. Individuals did, but the Academy as a whole has not. Uh, well, has seven, not taken that seven kind of members. Yeah, seven yeah, members, yes, yeah. but uh, these are these are rather uh, emotional uh, members, no, and they well, don't well, always uh, what appear I'm to be to say, too logical. What I'm trying to say, Dr. Shockley, is that. Uh, uh, as you freeze the situation with these graphs of yours, you take no into, into no account whatever the kinetic motion. Well, then I'll show you. I'll show you, you another you worrisome done, one. You could have done this to the Jews 100 years ago, to the Irish 50 years ago, and, 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 and so on. But mean, meanwhile, if what you're simply saying is we have a quantitative problem the way they have in India, and we want, since we've got to reduce the number of people to begin with, doesn't it make sense uh, to try to uh, reduce? the number of people whose production of children is irresponsibly done by the dissemination of knowledge. If you have somebody who lives in a ghetto, white or black, who has 17 children, the chances are probably that that person didn't want 17 children. And uh, to try to approach them with the available information doesn't strike me as all that uh, controversial. They do it in India all the time without being called racist. But you have something else in mind. You well, seem to take a certain pleasure, don't you? I was saying that that black skin uh, carries with it a congenital disadvantage. 
I don't get pleasure out of this, Mr. Buckley, nor do I get pleasure out of the way you're dealing with this matter. And I think it's evasive. I think that... I didn't mean you to take pleasure out of the way I'm dealing with this matter. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm disagreeing with you. You're disagreeing <laughs> with me, but it doesn't seem to me you're disagreeing with sufficient substance to, uh, that's warranted by this program. Now, uh, first of all, you did say you should look at these things in perspective. And I can fish in this pile, but I think maybe it's not necessary to say one of the things that worried me Put about your mind this in you can retire that if you want, because I think it might distract people. I think they've... Well, I think they all probably audiences have will have memorized good. those figures by now. Fine. Uh, the um, point I wanted to make, the thing that uh, alerted me in one aspect of this, was the very disconcerting study from the Surgeon General's uh, reports on the health of the Army in 1966, I think was the year. Each year, the Surgeon General's office gets out a report showing how many... Uh, draftees have failed their mental tests, how many fall into various mm -hmm. categories of mental ability, and how many fail medical tests. Uh, and uh, what this showed was, when I examined the data and looked at it, was that the uh, overlap, as it's called, for the black inductees had fallen to about six and a half or seven percent. What that means is that only six and a half or seven percent of the black inductees in that particular year exceeded the um, white median performance. I found in Audrey Shuey's book, the most extensive book on studies of uh, IQ tests of blacks compared to white, an enormous compendium. She'd made it her sort of her life work before she became emeritus a few years ago. I found in that a reference to a World War I study in which this overlap was about 13 percent. That is almost twice as many than were exceeding the white median. I uh, was going to give a talk at the Commonwealth Club in San now, Francisco. Now, 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 what is the meaning of this? I ask the when Surgeon General... exceeding the median, you mean physically and mentally or just mentally or just physically? This was physically? just mental, mental data. On the, if you looked at the mental classifications yeah, on uh. this, what you found was that they fell into a systematic, uh, a systematic distribution, yeah, and uh. this systematic distribution showed a, uh, uh, showed a, uh, a drift downwards. Here actually is the chart, which I've got arranged so I can find it without too much trouble. And I don't expect people to understand the axes, but I want them simply to realize that here is one line which represents uh, the, uh, the, uh, the blacks. This is another line which represents the white performance on these tests. And I'm simply saying the data is systematic. You see the, first, the divisions into first, second, third, fourth, and fifth mental groups in the test the percentages fall in a systematic line, not quite straight for both groups, so that you can conclude there is something orderly in this, and this orderliness but shows I don't, see any, I don't see any movement. They seem more or less equidistant all the way is, down, the, down the line. Uh, well, this movement, this is all at one time, Mr. Buckley, and yeah. the fact that they are approximately equidistant has a very a deeper significance, which is that in both cases, it is as if whatever was being measured is normally distributed and is simply differs in an offset. And that I find also at the present time on income distributions for, uh, for blacks and whites. It's a very uh, striking sure, thing there. Yeah, yeah, Christopher but Jenkins, but, but I, wa I wanted to go back, though. The time scale on this is not shown on this chart, but I'm saying where the offset was 7% then in 1966, there is data that it was about 13% in the form of one mention of that type of study in Audrey Shuey's book. So I asked both the Office of Education and the Surgeon General's Office by telegram preparatory to this talk whether or not uh, they had any information on this. Mm -hmm. The only reply I got was one from the Surgeon, uh, no, from the Office of Education, I think it was, saying uh, we suggest you get in touch with the Surgeon General. Now, now wait a <laughs> Uh, what, what do you uh, deduce from all of this? I say this is more indication of a warning, you see, and my main assertion a is that what? a warning that dysgenics may exist, just the type of thing which uh, you brushed aside see, in, the, my, the, uh, in my family the, size the chart people, and people, which I tried to put on a firm foundation. The people are getting dumber and dumber. Certain segments may be getting dumber and dumber, and no, those no, segments... No, but that's, peop that's people. You, you, let's use the gross figure. Well, if the, if, uh, if, if, um, X and Y are people, Y being the bright and X being the dumb, and X is multiplying faster than Y, then people are getting dumber, right? The average... The statement is, is of inadequate precision for this, Mr. Buckley. The point is, if certain segments of the population are increasing in percentage of the population very significantly, and those more or less definable segments are getting substantially dumber, then that should be a matter of concern that should not be avoided simply by saying you All are right. talking <coughs> about people. Okay, let, let's, assume, let's assume that nothing is done about it, uh, which, which probably won't be. Anyway, now let's, let's project the situation 100 years from now. So... Uh, 
all, uh, all the black I people and all of that, Mr. Buckley. But what? you may ask the question, but I will tell you. My time scale is 35 years, and I'll tell you why. But if okay. you ask me what's going to happen a century from now, right. I'm not going to bother to answer. <clears throat> the reason I pick that is that's about a generation and a half, mm -hmm. you see. And anything that happens now can really affect <clears throat> probably only the children that are being born within the next 10 or 20 years, you mm -hmm. see, affecting that attitude. And beyond that time, I'm not going to be here to have anything to do with that. Hitler uh, set up this program of a hundred, a thousand year Reich, you see, and, uh, and he didn't last even as long as my life expectancy is now. So uh, I say we should focus on that and we should look at things which are not now adequ adequately being looked at, and we could look, should look at them in Appalachia. Actually, I have a, I've been trying to promote a program with some enthusiastic uh, uh, individuals who may be able to organize this thing, to go into Appalachia. I was struck by the writing in uh, John Caudill's book, I think that's his name, called Night Comes to the Cumberlands. And uh, I have a page or so there that's very telling. He points out that when the more intelligent people left the Cumberlands, I think this may have been sometime in the 30s, the incidence of mental retardation of those who were there went up. Uh, the family size was large. The more, a bigger fraction of the people were unemployed <coughs> and even unemployable. Now then, what I feel we need to do is to look at that and see if there are strong hereditary factors. Now this is a white group and it avoids these questions of uh, if you talk about uh, Race, yeah. these things uh, you're at once uh, accused of being a racist and we haven't covered the difference between racist and raceologist which I hope we will have time to do. But uh, uh, to go in and see if these hereditary factors are really sound and are worth worrying about. And if one can do it then and find a legal way of doing it, try to set up a few cases of going in, well first doing polling to find out how these women would react two sterilization programs without bonuses, with bonuses, how much bonuses, and I would hope actually some test cases with the financial support adequately protected so one might 10 years from now be able to learn something more about whether or not there is severe <coughs> remorse on the part of the people who did undergo this or whether the attitude is, uh, is more comfortable. So uh, I'm, that's as far as I go in terms of advocating any action well, in, in, in this in area. First place, in the first place, in the case of the woman, it's a reversible process more often than not, right? Oh, I don't think so. Oh, I, you have a different know. kind of sterilization in mind. You, you have something that goes far beyond uh, Well, I'm thinking of the, tub the tubal ligation. The tubal ligation, yeah. Yes, whereas the vasectomy is, is not entirely irreversible, but it's, uh, it doesn't have a terribly high, that's the male sterilization, it doesn't have a high batting average. And while we're on it, the story I have from uh, some physicians who've done this is that this has no uh, negative effect on the, uh, on the sexual potency, but in fact, the hormones that would otherwise be lost in an ejaculation are reabsorbed so that the, uh, the uh, <coughs> frequency with which the sexual action can be performed probably goes up. Well, the <coughs> let me ask you this. If, uh, uh, if, <coughs> uh, if in Appalachia, as a result of uh, the incremental uh, Cronkite show, uh, the, the family discovers uh, methods of voluntary birth control equal to those that are known in Park Avenue, would you then be, be satisfied or would you say that um, as a social problem, the goal is the abolition of these uh, <clears throat> subnormal uh, progeny coming out of um, Appalachia? Well, the... Uh, so, so suppose suppose on your I've graph it came down to 1.3 the way the other people do. Uh, oh, this, this would that room? satisfy you? Yeah. Uh, not per se, because now we do get back into the happiness and the unhappiness area. And there, uh, in terms of happiness polls, there, there's not really too much information that I'm aware of. Gallup did one uh, a few years ago, and he went to people of various states of education, various uh, income uh, status, uh, blacks and whites, and the uh, numbers that I pulled out of this and looked at most closely were simply the comparison of blacks and whites. And here he asked three questions. Are you very happy, happy, or not happy? <coughs> and the uh, That's results... That's a very dumb question, I'm saying. <laughs> well, uh, you might do better, Mr. Buckley, but it's the only one I, I have I available. I hope I do better, yeah. I hope I do better because uh, <coughs> this has so much to do, uh, surely the answer to that, so, so much has to do with the temperament of the individual, whether that person is temperamentally optimistic or pessimistic. Incidentally, well, then if, you, the if you ask, if you the ask statistics me... statistics were very striking, Mr. Buckley. What well, it did show no, he, he, was he, he, a... He, he, uh, with this, if you want to, my, my own feeling is that there is a correlation between the amount of education you have and the unhappiness that you achieve. I'm the sorry, more, I the don't... The more educated you are, I, my guess is, the more unhappy you tend to become. Well, let me say in the term and gifted children, but, uh, but again, you see, this brushes away the fact 
And we'd, we started with this, with talking about this birth rate, these high birth rates at the bottom end, and whether this bottom end would, uh, if it reduced from 5.4 to 1.9 or 1.3 children, mm -hmm. if I would be satisfied. Yeah, would you? I would not be satisfied if the people I'm talking who about macroeconomically, would you be satisfied? Well, I, I don't see why, why I, I, but I don't need to talk about it macroeconomically. I'll talk about it how I see it, Mr. Buckley, and then, uh, then we go on, if you want to put it in another context. You mean even in your model, just in terms of your model, your Appalachian model? What I want to talk about is these children. Yeah. They come into the world, they may come in in a miserable environment, mm -hmm. they, may be, uh, they may be trapped in it, they may be unable to get out of it because they don't have the genetic constitution to do this, the power to deal in a competitive way with the situation as it arises, and um, as a consequence of this, in effect, they're genetically enslaved there, and there, they, there they're stuck. Now then, even if the number of children that come in are reduced by a factor of 10, think, still I think it's too bad for each and every one of those children, and that we should look at, and we well, should analyze this, and well, we should study it. We should use the brain of man to try to find out whether the sorts of things I'm worrying about are going on, and whether uh -huh. they do have significant well, genetic aspects. I think this is a very significant concession of yours. If I understand you correctly, it would entitle me to say that only a comprehensive program uh, designed to eliminate uh, progeny from people uh, whose progeny are thus genetically affected would satisfy Dr. Shockley. And uh, this, therefore, deprives you of the cover of any concern for the macro figures and ends you up uh, uh, saying, I, Dr. Shockley, believe that people with an IQ of 80 cannot achieve the happiness of people with an IQ of 120, which A, I deny, and B, I also say, I'm not all that certain that uh, people with an IQ of 80 are less useful than people with an IQ of 120. Well, in terms of employment at the present time, I'm afraid that they are less useful in this country. And if you get down to 70 or 65, then the, uh, then the unemployment gets very large. And maybe you don't, would not like what Herbert Hill, the NAACP's director of, uh, of, uh, of labor, said two separate years, which was the effect if things continue as they do now, almost an entire generation of uh, black ghetto youth will be alienated, uh, unemployed in a situation entirely foreign to those uh, existing in the United States. Now, your position may be, Mr. Buckley, and by the way, I don't agree with the uh, position you uh, uh, put uh, in my mouth <coughs> in describing where I stood any more than I agreed with the uh, things that you or Mr. Rusher put in your, um, in your columns. And uh, I would be glad, by the way, to furnish to any listener of this program who would write to me at Stanford University a copy of that exchange, because one of the things we were going to talk about, Mr. Buckley, was whether or not I could get your syndicate to distribute my column. You said we discussed that in this program. But that's another point. That, racism versus raceology. And now let's get back to this, uh, this happiness, unhappiness. Because we're leaving we, loose ends, you see. We, we're jumping around. <laughs> I think we should go back and talk about the 80% geneticity, which is really the most definite thing the control of genes by environment. If we could get that one where it was settled, we'd have a foundation on which we might be able to move solidly. Well, uh, over to you, Mr. Buckley. <clears throat> well, I think we might take, uh, uh, take this opportunity to, uh, to introduce our, our panelists. We don't want to cut them out. Ms. Julie Lesh is with the PAX, staff member of PAX, which is the Christian Center for Nonviolence here in Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, Ms. Lesh. Now, by the way, no speeches, okay? Just questions. Yeah. Um, Mr. Shockley, as, as Mr. Buckley has already pointed out, you tend to identify IQ as an indicator of intelligence, as an indicator of human worth, value. The, the word you used was usefulness, I guess, and happiness, you know? And I think there, if there are other socially valuable traits that people have, like a, a tendency towards mutual aid and cooperation, even species solidarity. Kropotkin said that, uh, that part of our biological heritage might be a tendency for species cooperation. Don't you think that maybe people should be tested for that and then sterilized or not sterilized, depending on how cooperative they are with the rest of the species? Uh, let, let's not say sterilized or not sterilized, but offered a bonus of varying amount, because okay. mind you, this is a voluntary. No, you're making, a very, you're making a very good point, and one, uh, one with which I would not disagree with anything you said there. I think I my point not... was absurd. What? I think my point was absurd. No, well, uh, uh, when you end up with a sterilization business, but as being able to measure human traits and finding out these things, and then trying to use them widely, this has to do with my three-facet faith from man, which I got through one faith, that perhaps that man has enough intelligence to deal with this one. The second one was he has enough humanism 
uh, to make good use of it. And the third facet is that on programs like this, by communicating these things, maybe I can get the first two facets into action. But the difficulty with what you're proposing is that there are almost no other things, I know of no other human behavioral traits, which are of comparable significance in terms of being clearly defined and controlled by genes, as is IQ. And, uh, and there's maybe some things where you factor the IQ, which is a very important aspect of some parts of this, finding different components, such as ability to visualize things in space, do what's called abstract reasoning and so on. But uh, uh, one of the things, that, the points that I make on this is, and here I think my facts are not in accord with some of the views that Mr. Buckley has, is that there was one extensive study done by Lewis M. Terman at Stanford, the psychologist who added the word Stanford under the Stanford Binet test obviously an enthusiastic university type because it's not the, it's not the term in Binet, it's the Stanford University and, it's, uh, and there's no way cold in the, in the French version, it's, it's Binet. But anyway, what uh, he did was to follow these, uh, follow these people for uh, some, uh, oh, 30 years, 40 years until uh, from being in, uh, in uh, essentially junior high or high school until they had raised families. And uh, he studied their... Um, I'll follow which people? The term and gifted group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You undoubtedly know a number of them. Are, you, aren't, you weren't in California, were you, Bill? Oh, when? And, uh, Mr. Buckley, I beg your pardon. Sure. You weren't in, uh, in uh, California when they picked them. You see, uh, uh, I'm in a very favored position <clears throat> on this because I am one of the two Nobel laureates whom Terman probably personally tested and missed. So the, uh, the IQ test is far from a perfect measure. And one of the most ornery, least constructive groups I've ever talked to was the annual meeting of the Mensa Society in Los Angeles. So IQ is far from everything. But nevertheless, these uh, gifted group uh, outperformed uh, the population in general across the board and in some very human sorts of things, such as less problems with alcoholism, less of them ending up uh, in, um, in jail, less divorces than the typical, uh, I think, college group or maybe the population as a whole. So IQ is correlated positively, in my opinion, with things which other people would regard as being really meaningful measures of human quality. And IQ is very largely genetically controlled. So this is a basis for saying we are dealing things with things in which this genetic control uh, may be significant, and we're not looking at them. And we're saying maybe they aren't important to look <coughs> at. And this, is, uh, this is why I welcome an opportunity like this, and I'll feel so much better about myself, uh, Mr. Buckley, if I do get some of these points across, and I welcome letters about it. Mr. Paul Newcomb is the program director <coughs> uh, in social work at Mercyhurst College. Mr. Newcomb. Thank you. <coughs> Are you aware of studies that have shown that um, northern blacks have higher average IQs than southern whites? And if so, how would you explain <coughs> only the smart ones move north? Or um, well, let me, uh, this, you, this is um, uh, the, the standard cliché business. I'm glad you asked that question because it comes up every time. And uh, one particular thing I looked into myself was, again, one of these Surgeon General reports. I think it was 1968. And I found only one state in which the percent of the blacks failing the uh, Armed Forces Qualification Test was um, as low as the worst white state and had six, there were only about a, a few hundred uh, black inductees in that state, and as I recall, had six more failed it, there would have been no state in which the, the blacks did as well as the worst white state. Now the other one, uh, the other one has been, I happened to get into a discussion of that only last weekend, I have not looked up the paper, there's a paper written by Henry Garrett, I believe about 19, oh, somewhere in the, in the late 40s, I think, maybe, maybe, maybe even 50s, in which he went over the work of Kleinberg, whom I believe is the finder of this, and the one who made this study to begin with, the one you quote, and found a number of methodological problems in it. Now, let me say one of the, uh, the things, the black population is very far from uniform, and I'm not satisfied with existing data on the statistics of black IQs. And one of the areas I've looked into is the degree of homogeneity of the black uh, population. And uh, I assert, and I would welcome uh, Mr. Buckley or someone else questioning some of the geneticists, whether or not I have not made the best calculation using population genetics of the fraction of the ancestry of the Oakland, California Negroes, which comes from Caucasian ancestors. Prior to my work, it was 22% plus or minus 1%. Afterwards, it seems like no difference, 23% plus or minus 1%. But what I also conclude is you cannot say that they're uniform. I can make an estimate that they're spread out almost as far in Caucasian ancestry as, uh, as their average is. Is there not a class bias built into IQ tests, for example? Uh, 
what do you do when you cut your finger? You put a Band-Aid on it's the correct answer. Rubbing mud on it is the wrong answer, even though both work. <laughs> the uh, answers to those uh, questions which say the tests are so culturally biased that you can't tell anything um, about them this way, there are a number of answers to that. And one is, of course, to simply show a, uh, a few uh, uh, tests, such as the group of the Cattell Culture Fair tests, uh, <clears throat> and ask why on something like this. You see, here are four diagrams, of which the fourth is missing. What's the next one going to be? What's the culture bias in that? But let me say the even more telling things are, and uh, some of these have been recently done by Arthur Jensen, is if you look at the relative performance of blacks and whites on IQ tests, and you factor these IQ tests so you find those items which are most culturally influenced, it is on those that their disadvantage is least. On su such items as the ability to visualize uh, spatially in three dimensions, this is one of the worst. I have a, we don't have time on this program, but with a typical college audience, I will ask about the work carried out by uh, Gerald Lesser at Harvard and his group, in which they went into the New York school system, different ethnic groups, different economic status, and divided the IQ test into four factors. One was verbal ability, and one was this ability to visualize spatially in three dimensions. Almost everybody in that group will guess that certainly for lower class blacks, their worst ability will be the verbal. Their best will probably be spatial. Actually, the data is essentially the opposite. So there's a whole family of this sort of thing, uh, which leads me to the phrase that I haven't used before in respect to racial differences, which I say, try to say precisely the same way, and that is my research leads me inescapably to the opinion that the major cause of the American Negro's intellectual and social deficits is hereditary and racially genetic in origin, and thus not remediable to major degrees by practical improvements in, in uh, environment. Are, I regard this as a tragedy and one that we should try to, to understand and to ameliorate. Are you saying to me that substandard education, substandard environments, lack of mental stimulation in, in one's early childhood has absolutely nothing to do with performance <clears throat> in IQ tests? Not at all. And the, uh, the, the ratio here is uh, that about 20% of whatever it is that pushes IQ around for typical Caucasian populations are not as good studies yet for blacks. But there's no offhand reason that I know, unless they are genetically very different from whites, why this ratio should be very different. But uh, this 20%, which is uh, of what pushes IQ around, that one can attribute to environment, uh, can and in fact would be predicted to produce this remarkable case that is frequently cited, the case of Gladys and Helen, the two white identical twins in the Newman, Freeman, and Holsinger study, who were the biggest difference reported in the literature for uh, identical twins. And the difference in environments were extreme. Gladys, I believe, never, passed, never got out of the fourth grade, and uh, Helen graduated from college. And the likelihood of that I, happening... I think you better explain that, that uh, Doc Chalk is talking about uh, uh, studies conducted with 122 identical twins who were separated. And uh, one went into an advantaged background, another into a disadvantaged background. So or into uh, different or independent ones. And the Gladys Helen was an extreme difference in background. So I am saying that uh, I, I note that extreme environmental differences, which will occur once in the order of 100 times in the typical Caucasian population, <coughs> can produce as much as a 24-point IQ difference. Yeah, to which I think it should, however, be added that uh, the E even if one even if one accepts the four to one ratio, which is controversial, uh, it nevertheless uh, would result from opportunizing on that one fifth that if it were successfully done, it would at least affect parity. If it um, were done, if it were done uh, in a discriminating that's way. Right, that's right, that's right. Is it um, Johnny the right pronunciation? Yes, Johnny. Miss Johnny Atkinson is a senior at Gannon College in Erie. Miss Atkinson. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shockley, my question would be, how does one measure, if we're talking about uh, intelligence, and it's usually been felt that uh, the contributory factors are heredity, culture, and environment. Yours is strictly heredity. Um, no, not strictly, 80%. Significantly hereditary. Uh, how does one isolate and measure the three different factors? Um, have, there any, have there been any definitive studies which... Uh, uh, isolate the the cause and effect of the effect of uh, culture and isolate the effect of environment and the interaction between the two well the ones I uh, think of uh, in respect to the environmental factor uh, per se the best study I know of was done uh, again in uh, Lewis Terman's school at Stanford by a uh, thesis student of Barbara Burks 
and she dealt with a uh, large group, I don't have the number committed, I think it's the order of 100 adopted children, and went into homes and uh, examined all of the stimulating factors that she could find and tried to uh, conclude which of these might be most important. And by looking at these environmental factors and uh, seeing how <coughs> much higher the uh, adopted children in, um, in the home uh, where these were good compared to the homes where they were not so good, she even set up a scale on these factors. And by taking that scale into account, she could account for about 15% of what was uh, pushing the IQ around. Technically, 15% of the variance could be explained by these uh, variations in the uh, environmental factors that she could identify. If we take the 80%, which we get by looking at the identical twins, and which is, uh, then gives information solely on the genetic side, in that case, it leaves 5% in between. Now, if I think of cultural factors being involved in this, I think the, uh, and this is not one that I uh, ordinarily talk about and don't know much about, but I will mention one thing that I think is relevant to it, and that is the finding of, uh, of uh, Terman's group, another PhD student, uh, Marvin L. Darcy, in about uh, 1920, 1922, who uh, studied Japanese children in California and on IQ found that these Japanese children uh, showed a negligible disadvantage, as I recall, compared to the white average. And presumably at that time, there must have been a substantial cultural, uh, cultural difference. Of course, we take the cultural difference between the U.S. and Japan. The, there have been other things in which the Japanese students in Japan, I believe, score higher than the, uh, than the American white students on some generalized worldwide uh, math tests. So I can't say too much about the specific <clears throat> influence of culture here, but I just throw in these comments for what I do remember. Con considering that your findings, are <clears throat> or those on which you rely, <clears throat> suggest that uh, uh, Jewish Americans, for instance, or Orientals score higher than um, uh, Gentiles and, uh, and uh, uh, Caucasians, would it be a part of the Shockley program to en encourage uh, uh, an increase in their birth rate to the disadvantage of the white birth rate, or, or um, do you lose your appetite at that point? Mr. Buckley, I don't think you remember my letter very well, you see. I, of course you, I, remember, you I remember everything, but I have to pretend how, I don't how, remember how do you, it so you, that you can you, say it. How do you do it? Uh, so that well, I can say you. it, so I can let you, you say Buckley. it. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, uh, you see, I, again, I say, I focus on anti-dysgenics, and that's the chart I need and didn't make today. I should have one that says anti-dysgenics that uh, if we operate, and I think that nature did tend to operate in this way, and I look back a while ago to things I had said about that in a paper I gave in 1965, and I wrote this. When you said we want more Lincolns, you were using a figure of speech. Frankly, I don't, uh, now I think I do remember this is, uh, this is, uh, yes, I think this is U.S. News and World Report interview, and maybe that is there, and that I said in 1965, I think it was. I'm afraid and I'm going to have to interrupt you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shockley. Ladies and gentlemen of the panel, ladies and gentlemen. For a printed bound copy of this program, send 50 cents to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. That's 50 cents to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. Production funding provided by public television stations, the Ford Foundation, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.